February of 2020, something amazing happened, and it wasn't that MacBook chime. <laughs> I was walking around Hyde Park, and I had one of the worst headaches I had ever had. Um, I was feeling woozy, a little bit dizzy, and I encountered a friend, um, a couple of friends in Hyde Park. And you know, they were like, hey, Mike, you don't look great. Like, what's happening? Are you OK? And I said, you know, I got this headache. I'm feeling woozy. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I didn't eat well that day. And so um, they say, like, hey, you know, come home. You know, come, come to my house. We're right around the corner. Um, Bonnie's got some chili on the stove. We'll make some tea and, you know, feed you, uh, get you a drink. Maybe you'll feel better. We'll take you home afterwards, right? We'll drop you off. And so they took me to the house. Um, I, I had that chili. I had that tea. We had some great conversation. We caught up. And then afterwards, you know, uh, dropped me off at home. I was sick for a week after that. And I was like, man, that was a terrible case of the flu. And you know, now it probably wasn't a case of the flu. March 2020, um, my, at my office, they say, um, we're going to be out of the office for the next week. You know, we'll probably be back in a week. You know, just the thing. This will blow over. We were not back in the office in a week. So um, why that intro? After we come out of this, in, in, into this space of this pandemic, once we realize we're in a pandemic, mutual aid initiatives uh, sprout up, right? Um, and they blanket the city. All of these initiatives that are engaging in food support for their communities, um, all of these initiatives that are engaging in, um, you know, in, in community-based mutual aid, um, cash assistance programs, assisting with houseless folks, um, all sorts of things are happening in community uh, because people are, are activated. They're like, you know, um, who's coming? We don't know who's coming. We don't know what we need, but we know that we can do what we need. And as we move through 2020, that keeps happening. It's a rolling tide. It keeps going. Cash assistance programs are happening via PayPal and Venmo and Cash App. Uh, GoFundMes are sprouting up. People are finding ways to address the gaps. At the end of 2020, as we get to the end of 2020, people are wondering about the second wave. They're wondering, like, what's next? Um, how are we going to keep this going? But they're also encountering the legal and tax. Um, all of these other realities of our financial system are encountered by them. And so they're understanding the implications of moving that money around. And they're wondering, like, how can we keep this going? But how can we keep this going in ways that do not uh, you know, impact me personally, that do not impact my family, that do not impact my household? So I'm going to pause that story, and then I'm going to log in, because we will need this computer at some point. <laughs> And I know my password, which is great. Um, so we've got these community mutual aid initiatives. They're continuing through um, the, the course in, in 2020. And they're wondering how they're going to keep going. And they're, they're, again, they're encountering this financial system that is smacking them in the face, right? Um, that is saying that you cannot move that amount of money around. Um, you know, if you're not a legal entity, if you don't have a, a not-for-profit organization, um, if you are an individual, we will basically punish you, right, for, for doing that. OK. <laughs> Whoa. So we're going to punish you. Um, if you move that, that amount of money around, um, we, we need you to be able to um, account for how that money is being moved. We need you to account for where it's going. We need you to talk about you know, what's the sort of, um, uh, you know, who, who's, who's spending it. Um, we, you need to have receipts. You need to account for all of those things that are happening with that money. And these are small grassroots initiatives. These are folks who don't have that type of infrastructure to back them up, right? And so what are their options? What do they do, right? Um, my name is Mike Stroh, Program Manager with Open Collective Foundation. You saw all of that stuff in the intro of the Shy Heck Night, so I'm going to try to be brief on that. Um, but I am someone who is deeply interested in that. I am someone who cares about logistics. 
Um, and, and, you know, and, and in the words of our, one of my colleagues, Caroline Woolard, um, I'm a radical administrator. I like operations, and I like to see the level of detail uh, that projects need show up. And so that's why I'm here at Open Collective Foundation. And I'm going to give you a bit of a metaphor. So there's this metaphor, and you know, what this thing says isn't really important. Um, so I'm not gonna do that. There's this metaphor that we use in Open Collective when we talk about circles and triangles, right? We talk about this world in which there are circles and there are triangles. Uh, triangles are the legal entities um, that have a very easy time moving money between one another, right? Um, it's, it's very easy for a not-for-profit or a for-profit organization to give money to one another because they have that infrastructure behind them. But then you have these circles, you have these groups of folks who get together and they start a project. Perhaps they start an open source project, perhaps they start a neighborhood association, perhaps they start a grassroots mutual aid initiative, and they don't have that infrastructure. And so when they are doing good work and people try to give them money, things get confusing, things get muddled. And Open Collective exists basically to solve that problem, to solve that issue, that gap where people are trying to start these initiatives and they don't have that infrastructure and they need that support. They need someone to actually show up for them on that. So the, what are the sort of um, the concrete things that the Open Collective platform does, right? is allow transparent financing for, for these organizations. So it allows them to be able to share their budget um, in the most transparent way. And you know, I'll talk a little bit later about the sort of coding aspect of this because this is an open source platform, but it allows groups to share that budget, which is a really critical thing because what we saw during this sort of uh, you know, latter stages of mutual aid was that as groups were moving this amount of money, um, certain scandals started to pop up. There was an issue with the Austin mutual aid. There was an, and you know, which is intriguing because we'll talk about that later. They are actually now one of the bigger funders on this platform. But people wanted to know where their contributions were going. And so the Open Collective platform that we use within, within the Open Collective Foundation allows for that transparent finance and transparent budgeting. Um, these groups were raising money via GoFundMe, free of PayPal pool, Again, Venmo, Cash App, all sorts of methods that they were trying to, to move contributions. The Open Collective platform brought, brings that function in. Um, it allows them to, to receive contributions on the platform um, in, in very simple ways, right? Ways that their communities can understand, you know, setting up goal-based contributions, um, setting up, you know, sort of meal programs, all of these, um, you know, opportunities that are available. Groups are able to manage expenses on the platform. So, um, they are able to, if, if they need to pay someone, which is a really important thing because the roots of this platform actually go back to open source projects where folks were trying to pay maintainers, right? And in, in, order, to, in order to pay those maintainers, you know, do you pay the one person? Does the one person need to open a bank account? Does the one person need to be a legal entity? What, what are the options that need to happen? So in this instance, in the open collective, they actually have a dashboard, they have, a, have an entity that they can pay, and then the maintainers can decide amongst themselves, how are we gonna split this budget up? Are we gonna issue a bounty? You know, what are the options, opportunities that we need? There's community engagement aspect to this, right? So um, if you want to actually update people about what's going on with your project, there's functionality and there's features to be able to issue those updates to your community, which go out in the form of emails, which you know, are posted to a dashboard, posted to a page alongside that transparent budget. So these are sort of other um, functions of this, this particular platform, community engagement. And there's a conversations feature which allows the community to show up on the platform and talk to one another about what's happening in the project, if there's something they disagree with or something they wanna celebrate and acknowledge. And then there's this um, leaderboard. There's this celebrating of the financial contrib contributors, uh, being able to acknowledge uh, organizations that are giving to a project, individuals that are giving to a project when they showed up as a contributor the first time. And then, you know, the accountants love this within the platform. There's the monthly report feature, so being able to um, download the entirety of your budget and everything that's happened on this project and, and for whatever reason you need to export this information, it's available. And the, the important thing about this, not only being open source, right, you know, you know, is that it's free. It's free for the collectives, right? 
this this platform in some in in, in it runs mostly on tips but there's also some uh, fiscal host, which we'll talk about in a moment, which is what Open Collective Foundation is, um, that actually charge um, basically an, an administrative fee for projects that they're hosting. And some of that gets back to the platform. There's a platform split. But the collectives themselves are not actually paying for the use of this platform. So what enables this, this infrastructure, right? The platform itself is just code, right? It's just the technology that is enabling all of these features to come together. And again, we're assembling features that these collectives, uh, certainly around the mutual aid, but also around you know, other types of associations, um, need it in one place, right? They don't need the entire feature set of a QuickBooks. They don't need the entire feature set of a Xero. Um, they needed some really basic accounting tools, some really basic fundraising um, applications, uh, some really basic expense management. And, and to be able to manage that all transparently in one place so that they can make decisions together is a really important thing for, for the collectives that we host on the platform. But the platform itself is one part of it. The other part of it is the international network of host organizations. So our biggest host organization, almost 3,000 collectives here, is Open Source Collective, right? Which effectively is hosting, you know, again, nearly 3,000 open source projects um, worldwide, right? Um, and you know these are these are now relatively large projects, projects that have um, fairly big maintainers. You know, and I mean, at, you know, Facebook is giving here. You know, not that we want to, whatever. <laughs> you know, um, but these there 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 are maintainers that whose uh, infrastructure, whose programs, whose whose projects are you know embedded in the sort of the, the technology that we use all all throughout, right? Um, and they're they're in, inside of Open Source Collective. They're able to you know, run bounty programs. They're able to pay maintainers. They're able to incentivize people to stay with the, with the application you know, for, for a long time, for a full life cycle, right? Open Collective Foundation, another one of what's called our first party um, host, right? There are some first party hosts, which you know, basically team members who were with Open Collective spun off and you know, uh, started a host. And then there are third party hosts, people who just came to the platform on their own and wanted to host their projects here. But Open Collective Foundation, a 501c3 uh, fiscal host here, in, based for US organizations, right? US um, grassroots charitable organizations. Open Collective Europe, Accountable, which is with the Social Change Agency out of the UK. So this international network of, of fiscal hosts um, basically a, a, a lends their legal entities to, organiz to, to, to collectives that are on this platform. So a collective you know, um, goes to a host, sees that they match up with their impact areas, they want to get hosted, they can borrow their legal entity and use it, right? Now, here's the other part of Open Collective. Every aspect of the platform and, and the organization that sort of houses it is open, right? There's open documentation. Um, you can come on Slack and you can actually talk to all of the staff members, all of the developers, other people in the ecosystem. Um, we have blog, a blog where we post all, post all of our case studies about different collectives that are using the platform, the open code that's on GitHub, the open finances. So it's not just that we built this platform and then we hide how money moves through it. The entire budget of both Open Collective, Open Collective Foundation, Open Source Collective, all of those things are, are, are visible and transparent on the platform. And then all of the metrics and financials are open. So every part of this is about transparency because that is the thing that, that we value. And, and we, we transmit that value to the collectives that we host. Now, a little bit of background on Open Collective Foundation, which does fiscal sponsorship as a service. So again, you know, 501c3, nonprofit, and our entire, our entire operation is around fiscal sponsorship as a service. So we are a first party host that wanted to innovate in this area. Open Collective, the platform was an innovation and we wanted to extend that innovation to what we see as this sort of um, very stodgy you know, um, fiscal sponsorship service that does not change a whole lot. And if, if anyone's run a grassroots project and has dealt with other fiscal sponsors, um, it's, it's, a, it's a mind change you know, to, to actually deal with Open Collective Foundation. That's the team that you know, backs me, that sends me here tonight. So you, know, you can wave to Pia and Alina and Lauren and Nathan, Alana, Kayla, Caroline, Ember, if you're out there watching, um, probably not Caroline, because she's in Germany. 
But, um, you know, these are the folks that actually make up the, the, the team behind Open Collective Foundation. And specifically, I want to highlight Pia, the founding director, because this is important for the DNA of this organization, right? Um, Pia comes from Argentina, where she founded a, or, or helped to launch a platform called Democracy OS. Now, Democracy OS was a, a tool that enabled groups to get together, take a piece of legislation, and as a community, vote on the direction that they wanted their, their elected official to vote on the legislation, to tell them wh how you should vote. Now, it's up to certain, the, certainly the elected official to be able to determine if they're going to follow that vote. But you know, this, this is sort of an, an element, an aspect of what the, you know, what, what's embedded in the platform right here, you know, just this, this ethos, this, um, these sort of background, these goals. So we're trying to remove friction and barriers from initiatives that start. And one, one initiative that I want to highlight is Okeonu Birth Foundation out of Denver. Now, Okeonu um, does one very tactical thing. Six weeks of postpartum meals for families. Not for you know, the, the single birthing parent, but you know, the entire family. And that's a, that's a simple tactic. It's a simple strategy, but it's for a larger mission because Okeonu Birth Foundation wants to actually build an ecosystem in which those families feel cared for. Now, I had an opportunity to interview Jacqueline and talk about the, the, you know, why you know, Okeonu chose to use the platform, and Jacqueline talked about if she had to do the whole thing of like launching a not-for-profit, beginning to deal with tax compliance, that was not something that she was going to do, and so the project that, would, that could exist may not have existed if not for you know, a, a, an infrastructure or a platform that, that like Open Collective Foundation. And this is what I want to uh, highlight about what happened during this sort of mutual aid moment. And I, I, I don't want to you know, pr uh, put, put forward the perception that you know, Open Collective is, as a platform is some sort of genius. We just happened to be there when these, when these, uh, it, these collectives needed something like this, right? Open Collective had been in existence in 2017, and in the moment in 2020, when groups were raising money, when there were millions going to Austin for the winter storm, there was a platform that could meet the need for certain levels of transparency that might be necessary. So who do we host? You've seen some of our, our, our projects throughout the city, right? The Love Ridge. Um, perhaps there's a Love Ridge right next door to you. But the Love Fridge is hosted on Open Collective. Um, the, you know, there's um, community mutual aid uh, fridges in Denver, uh, Bronzeville Kenwood mutual aid, um, mutual aid books. So there are collectives all throughout the nation that are, are using the platform for the purpose of, again, raising money, doing it transparently, making decisions together, and removing the friction for them to continue doing the work that they want to do in their community. And you know, further projects, um, Bushwick IU to Mutual, so on. So what's the end goal for Open Collective, right? Because there's, there's the technology, there's the developers, there's the platform, um, there are our network of fiscal hosts, but what is the reason that we, we are, what are, what are we moving towards? Um, and 2020 showed us that we needed to pivot strategy, right? We needed to, to refocus in terms of what our, our focus was. Before I arrived, I'm three months old in terms of this role, but before I arrived, they didn't have the focus on the mutual aid collectives that came online in 2020. And so they recognized in their strategy, they needed to pivot and move closer to those, those collectives. And so this is the future of Open Collective Foundation, right? We are building the legal, financial, and technical comments for the solidarity economy. We are focused on, on leaning into having this financial commons, and the, the goal of Open Collective Foundation is to, to host more of these mutual aid initiatives, to enable more of these organizers to stay in the work if that's what they want to do, right? And also to, to build this ecosystem of, of, of open source initiatives that are connected to mutual aid groups, that are connected to fiscal sponsorship, um, this entire infrastructure, this entire community of practice where, you know, again, technology and social change come together. And 
this is uh, just an explanation of the solidarity economy movement for folks who may not be familiar with that, that framing you know, or that term, community ownership, democratic governance, political, cultural, economic power, right? You know, this, this is something that we are focused on, on ensuring that our collectives um, you know, are, are connected to and the, the ways that we are leaning into and supporting our collectives. Connected to worker cooperatives, connected to uh, you know, other sorts of initiatives, other cooperative banks or credit unions. Again, building up this financial commons so that everybody has access to the, the, the things that they need inside of their community um, in equitable ways. But the longer term goal. So this starts as an, 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 an initiative launched by a couple of co-founders who saw a need for this, who saw that they had been on startups, who saw that they had been in projects where managing money together was a problem. Trying to hold money together was a problem. So they launched this platform, and usually the end goal of platforms like this is an exit to some investor, gets bought up by an organization. But what's the goal of Open Collective um, as a platform? Exit to community. So, the goal is that this platform in the future will be entirely owned by the, the network of hosts, the network of collectives that are using the platform, right? So full platform cooperation by community rather than by some other sort of acquisition or IPO. And so that's, that's the sort of overview of uh, Open Collective Foundation and Open Collective. And ultimately, I'm interested in um, ensuring that as groups are trying to move a mission, uh, trying to move their social change, that they know that they, that, that they don't have to immediately jump to uh, launching their own legal entity, but they know that they have options, right? They know that they have options um, because there's a, there's a statistic you know, that's, um, that, that's floated in the fiscal sponsorship ecosystem. And it's that until you actually have an, a rolling budget of $5 million, launching a nonprofit is probably not a great idea um, and, and, the prop, and the problem is because you spend most of your time raising money, right? You spend most of your time seeking, seeking additional funding to hold up this administrative infrastructure. But what if we could actually build a shared infrastructure that can be used by multiple different projects? And, and, and that, that's the entire focus of that shared infrastructure. And we, we, don't need to be, we don't need to have just one with an open collective foundation, but we can have multiple hosts. So we are not competitors with any of the hosts on our platform. We are all partners in an ecosystem in our specific communities and in our specific context. And in fact, if you would like to host a network of cooperative organizations, or cooperative businesses that are being incubated, then we probably have a host seat for you. So a pause there. Um, that's Open Collective Foundation, and that's how we open source the not-for-profit organization. One minute and six seconds. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, folks who have questions, go ahead and raise your hand, uh, and I can come to you. And then Josh, uh, if there's folks from the live stream that have questions, you can um, just let us know. So first question. All right. Um, hello. Uh, so this seems like a really valuable infrastructure, particularly in an emergency. So I'm wondering if uh, there's anything so like for folks in a community that were affected by a fl major flood or climate disaster like fire, are, are, is there positioning around what this can do for rapid response organizations? Yeah, um, it's, it's likely not actually going to be able, we, we don't spin up any organizations. Um, organizations, communities that want to respond to disaster, they find us um, or, or we seek them out, you know, I mean, we, we, we let them know that we are available to support them, and so when they want to spin up a project, we are available to help them raise money, to help them connect with others who have, who have spun up projects like this. We are available to help them connect to an ecosystem of projects that are responding to their communities in, in these ways. So uh, that, that's what I would say that, that our role is. We see our role, again, as you know, radical administrators in liberatory logistics, uh, being able to be there to have a supportive infrastructure for projects that want to start. So Open Collective itself hosts 2,000 organizations or something like that. Um, as a like it lo loans out its 501c3 status to them so they can collect money. 
Am I understanding that? Um, that that's not my whole question. I just want to know that, like, if that, if that is so. I'm just curious. Like, is this kind of a stage where people, um, organizations, mutual aid might like seek the sponsorship and then eventually form their own 501c3, or is this kind of like a long-term, like a forever partnership? And like, is are there any other organizations doing this? Is like, is this like a kind of a hack of the 501c3 status? Like, are, is a federal government going to notice? Be like, oh my god, like they're hosting twenty thousand different organizations, like. Is anyone looking at this? Like, is it? Are, I'm just, I'm just curious about that. Uh, so, Open Source Collective definitely hosts, you know, 2,900 open source projects. D different first party hosts. Open Collective Foundation hosts 300, you know, currently um, civic, social, mutual aid organizations, including one that I talked to the other day, Council Data Project, who was like, Chicago's on our roadmap. So, I don't know if any of you know Jackson Maxfield Brown, but you know supposed to be talking to you all, you know, because he wants to be in Chicago. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, th so we, it, it is a hack, right? Um, it's a hack in the sense that fiscal sponsorship has been around, I mean, unlikely as long as a not-for-profit organization, but um, there's not been much transformation in the fiscal sponsorship space. Um, so I have another fiscal sponsor whom I won't name for another collective that I'm a part of. I, I have a couple of different, you know, projects that I work with, because I, again, I administer projects. Um, and if I want to get a report, I email a person. They say I have to talk to the accountant. And if I need to submit a, re a, a check request, I have to print off a form. No, actually, I don't print off the form. I have the PDF, and I can amend my digital signature to it. But I still have to send that form by email back to somebody. Now, it doesn't have to be this. It doesn't have to be that painful. But if you're a small not-for-profit organization, you're not, in, you're not building your technology infrastructure, right? You're, 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 you're focused on whatever your mission is, and you, know, you, you hobble together what technology you will. We are a technology first organization, and so we're able to make changes on a very swift basis. Um, when, when collectives tell us that like, they need a thing, for instance, cash assistance um, became a really big thing among our collectives. They were receiving money, and they were like, we want to give cash out to people. How can we give cash out to people? At the time, we had two expense categories, reimbursements and expenses. You had to pay for something, and you get reimbursed for it. How can we do cash assistance? We talked to our lawyers, we talked to our accountants, and we pulled together something that made sense for the law. So yes, we hacked the law so that we could get our group's cash assistance. So it is a hack in, in, in that sense. Um, first, thank you. I'm part of a mutual aid group that uses Open Collective, so, and everybody loves you, so thank you um, for the work that you do. But I'm curious, like, where, what does the platform use to actually transfer the money, like the infrastructure? Like, who do you all bank with, and like, how do those decisions relate to the values? Like, I'm, I'm just curious about the actual like, payment infrastructure on the back end, or on the foundation side. Um, so Open Collective Foundation is housed in, you know, it housed in California, and we bank with um Umqua Bank. Um, so we, we simply try to lean into our values, and we've tried to find the most responsible bank we could find in California, which is just happens to be where one of our staff members lives closest to, so it was an okay thing. Um, but so effectively, yes, we make decisions just based upon the values within the team. Um, hopefully... As a collective, you have felt that we have tried to reach out and draw in other values and draw in other feedback. Um, so that is certainly something that we are trying to do even before we get to this exit to a community phase. We're trying to draw on the feedback of the collectives as well and listen to your values, right? Um, hi. Uh, so I, I have maybe some wonky questions because I help run a nonprofit, but I'm just curious, like, by providing fiscal sponsorship, uh, how does that work on the, like, y'all have to be registered in every state. Is it only available in the US? Uh, what happens if you get audited? Do you guys have lawyers? Like, kind of curious on that side of things. Also, if you have lawyers, can we borrow them? <laughs> um, so, yes, um, we do have lawyers. Um, I, are, I don't know which states they're licensed in, so I don't know if you can borrow them because you know, they may not be able to answer questions for Illinois. Um, and in terms of our fiscal sponsorship, 
So this is the sort of where the wonky, you know, fiscal sponsorship language goes, right? Fiscal sponsorship has two different, generally two different models, right? Model A fiscal sponsorship is what's called comprehensive fiscal sponsorship. That's where when you get fiscally sponsored, the, the program basically becomes a project of this larger not-for-profit not organization, right? So your circle in this triangle, right? Um, Model C fiscal sponsorship, and, and, and in that instance, you don't have a legal entity, right? There's, there's only one legal entity, which is this larger sort of not-for-profit. In Model C fiscal sponsorship, that's where organizations can sponsor someone who already has an established legal entity. Maybe you have a state-level not, not non-profit organization, you know, incorporated, um, and that entity could be sponsored and still maintain its own legal entity. We don't do that. We only do Model A. And so effectively, when, the, when we get audited, right, you know, they're auditing all of the different programs under our umbrella. So you know, every year, our executive director has to go through this, pro this process of auditing 300 you know, different organizations, or now 300, um, last year 200. So, th so yes, we, 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 we examine the budgets of all of those different organizations. And fortunately, the technology and the platform that we, we've implemented allows us to export that data very easily. Um, and, and, you know, be able to kind of, you know, show up to that audit without getting looked at, you know, uh, once or twice, so. Any questions from the live stream, Josh? No? Oh, there's one, there's one from, yo, Joel, Joel speaks for the live stream. Live stream here. Uh, <laughs> does an organization have to be a 501c3 nonprofit to be eligible for being supported by the platform can it be a social enterprise that is not a nonprofit? Okay, um, and this is where I put the, the fine line between platform and foundation. Um, the platform itself, any organization can use the platform, so we would love if lots more not-for-profit organizations signed up to the platform, use it to manage their budgets on the platform, you know, that, that doesn't impact Open Collective Foundation, right? Um, two, different, two different entities. Um, and so any, any organization, any for-profit business, not-for-profit business, any organization can use the Open Collective platform to make their budget transparent. I have an LLC, and my organization is on there, also, although I, I don't run my full budget through there. It's just I was trying to pay some collectives through there. Um, and so you know, that, that's, that's the platform, Open Collective Foundation, None of our collectives are incorporated. None of them can have a legal entity because they are under Model A fiscal sponsorship, which is comprehensive. I have a question. <laughs> uh, so I'm kind of curious. You were mentioning um, some dollar amounts, like you mentioned, like oh, offhand, like if you're a five million, you need five million dollars to start a nonprofit, generally because of all the overhead. What is the threshold? Because I actually I was involved in a mutual aid group in Oak Park where I live, and we never like. I think there was talk about forming a nonprofit, but we ended up just giving money to people, and it was like probably on the order of like thirty to fifty grand or something like that. So, when does it? Maybe I, maybe we did something wrong. I don't know. But like, uh, what is sort of the threshold for where it really makes sense for uh, a platform like yours to come into play? Um, you've reminded me that I didn't answer your other question about incubating groups. So yes, um, if a group wants to start to turn into a nonprofit themselves we would love to like, you know, roll them off, right? So, when, so we've actually got a couple of groups and we, we provide basically an intermediary step for them to get their organization up and running. We've got some groups that are in that space where they wanna form a nonprofit and so they wanna employ somebody. We've now rolled out employment for initiatives, right? Because we had that infrastructure internally and we could lend that infrastructure to those groups. So they, 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 they don't want to hop to the nonprofit yet because maybe they're at like a $1 million budget, which, you know, while is big, is maybe not big enough to hold all of the different things you need to pay for when you start a not-for-profit. Um, for our platform, any group who has whatever size budget can, can, can join the sort of open collective foundation um, as it, and be a hosted collective. Um, I am the coordinator of the Colonel Collaborative Time Bank. And that has a budget, you know, of not continuous of like, you know, ten, uh, fifteen thousand, no, twenty thousand dollars at this point, right? Um, and you know, not huge, not substantial. I don't know if I'm going to get another grant next year, but you know, that is hosted on the Open Collective platform. There is not, we we are not. Um, and here's where I'll just kind of explain a little bit about the fee structure here. 
we host organizations at a, a 5% fee structure on any funds raised. We don't charge them any annual fees. We're not charging them an administrative fee. It's really just if you're crowdfunding and you get some funds in, we'll take 5% of that and that's it, right? You know, you can, you can hold that money in the account for 10 years. We don't care, you know. But, um, so, so that's effectively what, what sort of fiscal hosting is for us. Thanks, Mike. It's really interesting to hear about Open Collective. So that 5% is on top of transaction fees, correct? Like Stripe, if you have to use Stripe or some other means to co collect your fees, then that's, that 5% is on top of that, right? Yes. The answer was yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question in the back over here. Yeah. So I'm curious for just someone on the street. Let's say I live in Bridgeport, and I'm like, you know, this, this corner has been empty for a long time. It'd be a great spot for community garden. And I'm interested in organizing some people and some funding to get something rolling. Is that, like, as just someone on the street, is this a platform that I could look to, or at what point would I engage when we become a we, or how does that work just from this very ground level up when we would start engaging and using your, your service and which, which side of the line? Just because I'm a Chicago local and I know a little bit about the ecosystem, if you told me you were starting a garden and you didn't own the lot, I would say you need to go talk to neighbor space. But that's a sidebar. Um, if you have um, a group of people, in fact, the only thing that we require is that you have two administrators, right? You, you just, we, we, that's all that we're really looking at. If you tell us that you want to start a project and you have two people who want to run that project together, you know, and you tell us something that will talk about the, how your mission is, is fits within our impact areas, which are very broad, you know, we, we have broad civic, social, impact, and educational, you know, um, areas, then we are happy to host you and happy to allow you to start fundraising. Um, so that, that, that's, that's really it. Now, in terms of you know, whether or not you feel like you're ready to start a project, that's actually not a part that we're evaluating. We, we exist really to remove the friction to getting the, the fundraising started and having a legal entity that can do tax-deductible fundraising. So we don't necessarily do deep project incubation at this stage. Um, as program manager, I'm examining you know, what sort of programs we can outrun to help projects determine where they want to sit. Um, but you know, that, that is not something that, that we, we have active at the moment. I'm kind of curious, and I understand if you can't actually answer this question, but um, what percentage of like Open Collective's operating costs would you say are the technology infrastructure itself? Like, how much, uh, how sustainable is it to keep that sort of thing running? What is this? You can't hear it. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? I'm just kind of curious, like. Basically, like Open Collective is proposing this sort of technologized solution for fiscally sponsoring stuff, and I'm just curious how much uh, the tech part of that is of your like operating budget, aside from the labor maintaining it, obviously. Um, I want to admit that I don't have a specific number, and I can't even give you a narrow percentage. Um, I can say that. Open Collective Foundation, um, we don't sort of look at that area. Um, the Open Collective Inc. operates the platform, and as far as we know, the, and, and based upon their project, but their, their budget at the moment, they've been able to continue you know, spending their expenditures, paying developers, and holding up that platform, and you know, having a surplus at the end of the year. And so that's what we look at. As long as they can maintain their surplus, and you know, they, they're, they're, not, you know, um, they're not in the red at the end of the year, we're happy to continue, you know, throwing our platform fees at them for being a host on the platform. Yeah, so um, I'll just let you know, you've, you've already got the, that email there, mike at opencollective.com. Um, at opencollect is the Twitter handle specifically for Open Collective, the platform. Um, and at the moment, I don't know the foundation uh, handle because we just started the Twitter for the foundation. Um, but yeah, you can feel free to email me if you want to like schedule a meeting with me and you're like, hey, I'm really curious about this. Um, you can also have my Calendly, calendly.com. 
forward slash open mic, O-P-E-N-M-I-K-E. -E. Um, happy to like set up a meeting and talk to you about Open Collective as the platform, Open Collective Foundation. Or if you're just like, I'm curious about fiscal sponsorship and I want to know if I'm getting a good deal, um, I don't need to sell you anything, but I need to tell you about my experiences with fiscal sponsorship, and I'm happy to do that too. So thank you. Thank you.